Thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I'm particularly uh, touched by the, the theme of the conference, Thinking is a Way of Life, and I'm, uh, I'm very happy that you, you thought of me to uh, work this out with you to begin this conference. Uh, I shall also say that uh, I'm very pleased to be here uh, uh, with you in this program today uh, because I believe it's one of the rare places where um, uh, critical theory is welcomed and, and celebrated uh, in Canada. There are not too many of these places left, I believe. Not uh, in, in my part of the world, anyway. It's not uh, something that uh, is uh, valorized as it should be, I believe. So, so uh, uh, I think we, uh, we have much in common, or I have too many in this world. I would like also to thank you for. Uh, asking me these questions of thinking of thinking as a way of life uh, uh, in relation to my work. It's been, um, I, I have to confess I had a hard time in the past few days uh, uh, preparing uh, uh, this talk uh, because it asked of me that I go back uh, over 15 years of political theory and, and history of ideas I've been working on and try to figure it out uh, in a new way and try to share some uh, pieces with you here. Um, so I have sort of a working title, Repetition and Ruins. Um, I will mostly talk about repetition, which uh, I could say is my obsession, uh, theoretically and empirically. And has been for many years now since my uh, uh, doctoral research, and not too much about ruins, but hopefully we'll get into that uh, all through the conference and conversation. Um, I have a subtitle that's notes on the art of radical political theorizing. Uh, I, I pondered uh, if I should have. Uh, use the term post-colonial instead of radical, and, and uh, but to me they're the same. I think if we want to learn to think and act uh, post-colonially, we have to be extremely radical, more radical than we ever thought we would need to be, um, and, and that relates to uh, uh, the very beautiful question that's in the. Uh, the conference leaflet, for, which says, for, for instance, to what extent does the political problem of settler colonialism also pose a challenge to those of us who think and work in the university? Um, incidentally, I think these are the very questions I'm trying to uh, address in the way uh, I, I do political theory uh, as a labor. <coughs> So, to me anyway, it looks very nice, but what I will present to you today uh, will not be, I guess, very sophisticated. Um, two reasons. First of all, you, you'll soon uh, notice that I use a 50 words uh, uh, vocabulary in English. Although, interestingly, I can say everything I need to say with this 50 words <laughs> vocabulary. So it says something about political theory language, I guess. Uh, the second thing is uh, it's it's a work in progress and it's pieces I've tried to put together more to give you a feel of the work that I do than to present you with a uh, very uh, slick uh, argument. So it's not going to be linear, but hopefully it's going to bring things together and help us to uh, generate questions. I also have this PowerPoint that I'm not going to ruin these. It's just um, <coughs> you know, the 
few quotations I'd like to, to read with you and a couple of pictures I'd like to discuss. Maybe just a word on, on, on what it means to me to uh, be radical when theorizing. Uh, it means a very precise thing to me. It means uh, to uh, dismantle and decode and tackle and neutralize um, state production tropes in the theory and, and, and capital production tropes in theory. That's what I mean by radical. So it's both state and capital as a grammar that I'm trying to tackle and, and as a repetition and to eventually uh, through theorization. Now those two quotations from two uh, dead men I like. We, we love that protocol theory probably too much, but still. Uh, first one from Nietzsche. Words block up our path. <clears throat> Wherever primitive men, that's us, put down a word, they thought they had made a discovery. How different the case really was. They had come upon a problem, and while they thought they had solved it, they had in reality placed an obstacle in the way of its solution. Now that's the part that's interesting to me. Now, with every new piece of knowledge, we stumble over petrified words and mummified conceptions and would rather break a leg than a word in the way so. So, so this leg and this word, that's my object, that's what I've been interested in. That's what I've been trying to theorize uh, in the past 15 years. So let's say this is the, at, at an epistemological level uh, what my intervention is about. Let's call it the material di dimension of language, it's materiality. <clears throat> That's what I'm going to call repeating. Second uh, quotation from the thorough, why not? Uh, comes from a very different point of view uh, uh, than I. This is basically uh, complaining about the fact that his fellow citizens are illiterate mostly and not uh, well versed in, in ancient and in reading. So let's just go uh, down to the last sentence, or part of it. Uh, the, little, the little reading and storybooks, which are for boys and beginners, and our reading, our conversation and thinking, are all on a very low level, worthy only of pigments and mannequins. I'm very interested in pygmies and mannequins. I'm interested in political theory not as uh, something that is created by great dead men. I'm interested in political theory as the conversation and thinking and reading of the pygmies and mannequins. That's us again. So primitive men and pygmies and mannequins. That would be the sociological level of my intervention. I like to take a look in, in the shared, the anonymous, the tactile dimension of language, of thinking. Language and thinking is the same thing. <coughs> so that would be the object of my research. The site of repetition and rule. Now, I also work from a specific standpoint. So I'll say a word about that before I enter into what my notion of repetition is. The standpoint or the vantage point, the perspective, or where I stand, where I start as a political theorist is twofold. I like to start from the lowest level. 
this baby might be the pygmy or the mentor. I like to start at that level of the idiot, at that level of being new to the world, of not taking it for granted. The idiot is a phenomenologist. This baby is coming to the world and is taking nothing for granted. Everything is new to him. Everything is a question. So it's about curiosity. And it's about not asking the quantum question of why is it there is something as opposed to nothing, but rather why, why is it that there is that instead of this. Why is this world this world? So that's the vantage point I like to go to. It's a picture from uh, Robert Frank's uh, series called The American. It was taken in 55, 56. And there, um, there, there is another aspect related to the standpoint I was with this picture. And it is a jukebox. <laughs> So not only I like to start from the ground, taking nothing for granted, and above all, take, not get, taking for granted sovereignty or capital, but also I like to wonder about that too. The soundscape we grew up to, we grew up in, the buzzing that's around us. Where the jukebox comes from? Why is it there? Who's talking? Who's calling? Right? We come to this world and it's there and, and we don't know about it and it's buzzing around, around our head. So this baby's alone and on the ground, but there's this, we, we assume this jukebox is, you know, singing, talking. We have to answer to it or not. And, and, and if we don't have to answer to the jukebox, why? What's going on? So it's both about to be rid of evidences, every evidences, and also to be attentive to what we hear. And then I'm bringing this to repetition. Another element of the standpoint is, um, and, and it defines a little further what radical can mean it is that I like to approach everything as a baby, starting from a zero degree of power, making the hypothesis that everything is equal, that everything is being equal. It's, it's about measuring everything uh, to a mathematical point of absolute equality. It's not a normative point. I'm not saying we should be equals. I don't care about norms. I objectify norms. I don't care about norms. It, it's about, it's a methodological standpoint. Zero degree power. So it's, it's a conception of, of the world we live in where there are power accumulators, incredible power accumulators. It's amazing. This is what defines us, I think, as a civilization. What do we accumulate? We accumulate, it's the baby, we accumulate money. That's what I see. We don't need a, a more sophisticated language to say this. We accumulate enormous amounts of money. We need structure to capture money. And we have them, we have developed them. Structure our main grammar. And we accumulate guns. That's kids' realism. We should stay that way, you know, stay sovereignty, blah, blah, blah. We could also just say that we have accumulated a lot of religion and power. It's also a structure. 
capturing something in order to accumulate it, right? So the mathematical, the mathematical zero degree of power is starting from this level. Why is it that we have those structure of accumulation? How do they work? How do we repeat them? And the two bucks is all the buzz that maintain the grammar in place so we can accumulate what we've got. And I think if you look in the history of ideas, uh, there are some thinkers that have worked with this zero degree of power. I'm thinking of the Lagos spider of a network of tyranny. That's precisely that. Or uh, Uso and the origin of inequality. Um, Piat Lassa. This fantasy of the Guayaki people having created a grammar where no accumulation is possible. And also, Peter Gombrovich, uh, who is, uh, of course, a, a, a writer writing fiction. But I like his notion of a subject uh, that is a subject thought of. As, as if if it were if he were born perfect, he thinks of the subject as if the subject was born perfect and and singular. And the history of one's life is deformation, sort of a fall from perfection, which is not a prophetic fall or a theological fall. It's a, it's a fall into power, into the grammar of accumulation. So one's life as the history of deformation. We are deformed by social life. So one's own life becomes the archive of power in one's, in one's society. That would be the way to put it. As if we were born. So singularities are archives of power. So we have to bring our own lives and theorizing. <coughs> so that's my standpoint. That's realism for kids I try to work with. I'm not that young anymore. I'm not that naive. But I try to cultivate this uh, candor and, and uh, naivety. And I, I think this is what allows us to be truly radical, to question this all the time, as an idiot. You sound idiot when we say that society is about accumulating guns and, and, and money. It's more complicated than that. Of course it is, but at the same time it's not. Why is it this instead of what? So, so my Positioning or my disposition is to never, never, never accept this. You, you pay a price, the price of being an idiot. That, that's bad, you know. I'm a woman, I speak French. I, I'm an idiot. But it is radical if you work well and, and you're rigorous and, and you collect data. And, and you're, you're well read. You build something. You're not, you're not going to get married. But, but you're going to see things that you wouldn't see otherwise. Zero degrees is a good vantage point. Now, that was sort of the prelude. That I will now uh, 
try to be more precise in defining repetition, which is the main focus of, of every, each of my intervention and analyzes. Start as a very simple story, uh, very personal. Uh, it's questions that, that I bear since I know is that at some point in my life, I guess around 20, I started to realize that people repeat themselves a, a lot, a lot. When we talk about politics or political theory with people, people repeat things they heard. They don't make they don't make things up. It's amazing. So where it is talking about politics with my dad and watch a lot of TV or a, a reading political columnist uh, to teach myself about the political world. Or it is uh, uh, when I was a PhD student discussing theory with my peers or later teaching political theory to kids in Ottawa and, and, and then again reading my colleagues producing political theory. It, it amazed me how people repeat things they heard. We don't make things and men don't make things up because most of them were men. This is just a fact that I don't want to do with it. Just to be more precise. precise. So we, we hear things and we repeat them. And I think that is mostly what political thought is. Mostly. It's, it's a simple fact, but I think we should go into it and question it. Big means and mannequins. They repeat what they hear. There's a, uh, an intellectual, I don't know what's his specialty exactly in France, Jean-Pierre Fay. He has worked on that and created concepts to tackle this notion of repetition in, 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 in the political oral realm. He worked uh, on fascism in European societies and he has to theorize this phenomenon of repetition uh, uh, and called it chain discursive, discursive chains, or, or that is uh, sentences or, or typical groupings of meanings uh, which are used uh, simultaneously in discourses of diverse uh, origins, science, media, government, uh, uh, colloquial conversations. Uh, over a period of time in a given society. Uh, and these uh, discursive chains uh, make up what could be called common sense or the dominant ideology of a time. They find their way in private conversations, they weave into the texture of social representation. So it's aggregate of, of sentences or blocks of meanings and, 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 and they, they make appearance in different discursive uh, stratas and, and, and they are repeated at all levels. So there is a continuity between the highest political theory and, and the lower political conversation that we can trace by tracing those discursive chains. So what you have appearing there is an aggregate of, of repetition that is akin to a given time in society. So the aggregate evolves or, or dissolves or breaks or endure. Uh, but in any case, it is iterative. It has to be repeated to exist. An idea cease, ceases to exist when it's, it ceases to be repeated. Right? So it's a collective process. It's a speech process that's collective and iterative. So that's what we have to uh, uh, imagine or, or have a vision of for thinking of repetition. It's an empirical phenomenon. <coughs> and I tend to, to extend uh, Fai's con concept um, not only to speeches, uh, but also to all sorts of behaviors, uh, choreographies, ritual habits. We repeat meanings through both words and bodies and landscape. Now, contemplating this uh, phenomenon, we could contend, as I did for, for a very long time, that uh, 
repeating something and and the, it is something that equates not to thinking. I used to think that repeating is not thinking. Because I, I used to think that thinking is creation. It's, it's opening up things. It's saying something new. It's so, so I, I used to think that repeating was not thinking at all. Thinking is creation and repetition is not. But then I turned this over and I, I kept asking, is repetition thinking, and is repetition creative? And if we ask him, if repetition is creative, it certainly is. It is extremely creative. Repeating is thinking. Just we, we don't see it because, because repetition doesn't, doesn't make a sense, as, uh, doesn't give us a sense of a gap of a difference. We don't see it, but we're still thinking about it. So I think repeating is thinking, and repeating is a way of life. And it is because it is a connective, and thus a creative activity. So the quality of thinking to me is not creation, it's connection. <coughs> so what do we connect? We think, even in repeating. Foremost thing. We connect ontological sites, things, and ideas, or I, I prefer to call them passwords. We connect sites and passwords. And then we connect passwords together. That's very standard post-structuralist notion of what language is. It's things and words and culture. So the oral realm, the realm of repetition, is this system of passwords to connect together that makes what the phenomenology calls the world. Or the reality called reality. Doesn't make a difference to me. What interests me is this process of connection and redetermination that makes the world and that we're doing and thinking. A less read piece saying all around me about this is a very short piece by uh, Walter Benjamin. I suppose it is an illumination about the mimetic quality of language. It's referring to the idea that in language there's a gist of imitation of nature, if you want to call it nature. So the process of language is imitating nature and then getting autonomous work. We're just using passwords now. <coughs> and then we go on connecting ideas with ideas, passwords with passwords, forgetting about thingness. That's the process for me. So language is imitation and then autonomization. It takes, it forces from what there is. It appropriated. So through these connections between ontological sites and passwords, and passwords, and passwords, maps, we share are produced. So we share code, coding places that create orientation as modalities, practices, preferences, expectations, fears, values. These animated maps make the places where we live. Connections of sights and words. So we do not live on Earth. We live in mobile maps. We make by 
dwell in a closed symbolic valuation system that we get that level biggest graphic here. We dwell in a closed symbolic valuation system built in the open, indefinite flow of experience. These ontological sites, they are open, they are contingent. They appear and disappear. We make them. We make them relevant. I'm not saying that reality doesn't exist. It's not interesting to put it this way. I'm saying there's an open, unended, infinite, indefinite experience that is everything and that we pick from in the process of language, creating a dwelling, we inhabit it, the, the mobile map we live in. As I said, this is what phenomenology calls the world, if you need references. So, thinking as repetition thus contributes to maintain a realm of manifestation we live in from, on, and for. It is a power of invocation, magic materialism, roads, circulation, monuments, laws, borders, subjects, patronyms, property, races, sexuality, zones, lines, concepts, prices, all of these material symbolic occurrences are collective, uh, collective belief practices. They are repetitions, they are effect. They are the effect of thinking. That's why they aren't there, but they could might they might as well not be there. We, we're making them by thinking. Road is not a road. Or a road is a road is a road, that, that's the true sign we put it. <coughs> so this is how repeating is thinking and thinking is political. It makes space, directions a home, a clearing in the world, using Heideggerian lingual. It makes identity, it marks the land and grant thingness and value and property. So in this critical paranoia of mine, political thinking is assimilated to ontological landscaping. It is carving affectivity into a closed system of relation, form that sustain life, connecting and disjointing. This is why repetition is thinking as a way of living. It is the life that makes a place to live. So if we think of repetition as, as political thinking, as I'm trying to do, the political thought of, of pygmies and mannequins from, from, from the point of view of the baby, what, what do we get to see? It's not quite a baby that speaks here. It's getting a little bit more precise. Repetition makes things exist through semiotic redundancy. It's that, that's the unity of, of analyzes I use. And this is what a political object is. A road is, is a semiotic redundancy. A monument is a semiotic redundancy. A price is a semiotic redundancy. A political object is a discursive or a ritual effect. A cult sustaining the archive you call the home. And when I say home, I mean a crazy place. I'm not referring to the notion of uh, any notion of authenticity or truth. Or, uh, it could be uh, Kundera's Kitsch or Harper's Canada or Michael's, Michael Jackson's Neverland or, or the Oster of the Disfranchise or Yuri Kaprilov's Alphabet City or Las Vegas parking lot. This is what we call home, right? 
So thinking belongs. That's my other very important point. Thinking belongs to the category of meaning. We have to start to get serious about that. <laughs> I think we're not there yet quite. So as I mentioned, we need not to use speech in order to think politically. Voting is thinking, a bike to is thinking, standing for the national anthem is thinking, taking a job is thinking, asking for someone's identity is thinking, acknowledging indigenous land is thinking, paying for food or paying for education is thinking. Keeping silence about injustice is thinking. Vacationing in Varadero is thinking. Torture is thinking. Using Facebook is thinking. Thinking is a doing. It reproduces connections between science and ideas. It makes the world live in what it is. So basically what we're doing, us, the people of, of capital, State sovereignty, I was like, we that. Globally, that's what we need the most. Deeds, including speech, making things happen collectively that could have been otherwise more political. So, what we can infer from this is that political thinking, in this definition I gave, is at the same time, singular is it's a deed. The deed is, is, is a unique one thing ever. One, it, it's one moment. It's something you do. It's, it, it's, it belongs to the category of the eternal return. It's unique. <coughs> and it's collective. <coughs> the aggregation of singular deeds make the realm of relevance we work with in order to make a living collectively. Always singular, always collective. Holding to this consideration, I would go as far as to argue that repetition is the most common expression of local thinking and, a, and that it contains all the characteristics of thinking as a way of life. I even came to see this as a good news because it means we think a lot. We think like crazy. We think a lot. We think politically, always. We actually make things happen. So thinking matters immensely. It's not the feel we get today, being political theorists, doing political theory in Canada in the 21st century. Or the thinking matters a lot. And it's a good news too because it is possible to take responsibility for what there is. The place where we live could be something else than what it is now. And that means a lot. Now, I'm going to keep going on, but if you have questions, as from now, you can just ask them. And we can start a conversation. But more stuff I want to share with you. But we'll play it by ear. So that's the repetition part of my story. Onto with the epistemological level, which is which is not of course a formulation of what truth is or, or even of what there is. It's just an analytical strata I use to look at the reality we're in, trying to fit names and concepts in it, and trying to work it out. So I shall enter a little bit in the ruins part of my presentation. Because 
from this vision, I draw a program or, or a, uh, a specific way to think of what it is to do polka theory. What is there to do then? What do we do with that? Most of us, what we do is we go on our career repeating that and showing that different authors have, have said that too and you know, discussing elements of, of, of conceptual debates and trying to, we start repeating. Repeating that, that, that thinking is repeating, right? So if you're writing a PhD dissertation on Foucault, that's what you're doing, you're repeating this in a different language. And I'm, I'm thinking there should be a step further than that. We should quit writing a dissertation about Foucault. We should get to work. But what does it mean to get to work if, if we assess that? So to me it was, um, the first task to me was a, a descriptive one. It is exploring the realm of the repeated. And there's a lot of work to do there. What is it that we repeat? How does it work? But starting with <coughs> concrete singularities. What is a parking lot? What is a parking lot? What is a road? What is a car? Why is it that as a kid, I, I thought of that the other day, among my toys. Think of the toys you had as a kid. I had this car fleet, like a I don't know, 100, 100 cars in a little box. And I opened my box and I played with a car. Why is it that my parents had me playing with cars? Well, look out the window, right? It's everywhere. It, one of the main things we repeat there, and it's really, it's somewhere in there, 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 there cars. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's urgent that we think about cars in political theory. Some, some have done it, right? But, but it, there is much more to explore, much more than in Foucault, I find, because that's alive. That is alive. That is something we're doing. That is thinking. Car culture is thinking much more than Foucault. My love and I was trained with it. So the first task, exploring the realm of the repeating. So it's mostly a descriptive uh, endeavor, asking what are the things we make into things we learn from, on, and for by repeating? What gives, sh what shape to what? Take nothing for granted. What gives what shape to what? Where do we dwell? I'm not sure we know where we live, really. Where do we live? When we're acknowledging an a, a indigenous land, are we able to name ourselves? We're the people of the capital. We're the people of the car culture. Recognizing we're on your land. We don't say that. We're not, we're not even able to name our own land. Because it, it's, it's all muted in the realm of the repeated. Where do we dwell? What is our performed ontological landscape? Where am I? Thinking as a week, where am I? We haven't started asking this question that much, I think. But that's my first descriptive question for a program. My second question that will give you the question and maybe come back to it. First description, second action. What is given up? What is left out? Traded off, muted, or sacrificed in the making of this, these things we live in, from, on, and for? What is the accurate share of the deeds we have become? So what is the realm of manifestation of this grammatical structure? And what is the accurate share? What's left out? So these are the two questions I've been working with in most of my work in Borgo Ferry and 
and history of ideas in the last few years. Do you want me to go on or just have a bit of a conversation? Hello? <laughs> Keep going? So, two questions I said. Where do we dwell? Description. Second, what's the trade off? That's already action. First part is easier. So, I'm just going to talk about a few strategies uh, uh, to work on, on the different descriptions of the dwelling. Maybe it's time for me to uh, um, just say a word of, of what is political theory as a craft to me. First of all, it's a craft. It's not a lifestyle, it's not an attitude, it's not a profession. It, 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 it's a labor. It's something you do with your hands and your head, with your body. It's a craft. And to me, and we, you, of course, we have different ways of seeing it. But to me, it's it's the art of painting portraits of material symbolic dwellings. And it's it's the art of making things collective visible, making the re the, the repeated visible in a portrait. And I think we can only do that by taking a starting point in the daily life experience. The common, the pygmies, the mannequin, and rendering tangible the structures and forces, keeping it all in place. It starts by looking at the window, talking with the person who signs it. It is about it is about guessing the stage, what is there and what is not, what's in the shadow, what's gluing parts together. Maybe in the manner of a cubist painting, because it's not something you can watch across the street. A dwelling, a material symbol, a dwelling. So, in the manner of a cubist painting, you put pieces together and try to figure out an ensemble. It's thus a very patient and very uncertain, never ended labor. First strategy. To have a dwelling, to make a dwelling visible. Is to become a collector, a collector of discourses. In the big data style, we're looking for redundancies. That's what I started with. My PhD dissertation, that, um, which was on uh, the reception of Nietzsche in, in uh, the United States between 1980 and 2000. So I gather everything that was written on Nietzsche and political in those 20 years. It was a box like that. I brought it in a cottage and read it all. So you find a corpus. You organize it to see what it presents itself. It's very inductive. And then you try to find out categories. And then you try to figure out what's gluing it together. What's the repeating? How far does it go? Where does it not go? What, what is excluded from it? And if you read the read scholarship, it's very obvious what's excluded. Because most of the scholarship is excluding. It's an excluding function. So it could be any corpus. I did it uh, uh, that time for American scholarship on Nietzsche. I did it for a, a right wing columnist in Quebec, gathering columns over a period of time. It's big data style. 
bring in a bunch of stuff. So, so uh, why I said it's a bit patient. <coughs> So it's, it's, it's about capturing herds of words, sharing common characteristics of time, place, and try to identify repetitions, redundant groupings of meaning, repet repetitive images. It's pretty easy to do, it's, it's just long. So corpus could be commissions, audiences, public debates, media content, scholarship, TV shows, blogs, transcripts of all sorts produced by agencies and corporations, uh, advertisement, uh, state-sponsored work of art. It's infinite. So it's, as I said, <coughs> giving some attention to what you hear, what's there, what's with the buzz. We have all sort of ideas of what's going on there. Mostly we guess them and we repeat what uh, inspiring and teachers told us about it. But when do we really get to dive into it and see what's there? Um, and I find it useful to be partially attentive <coughs> to the oral realm. Um, because after the Nietzsche thing, I started to work on um, indigenous uh, vocal theory to discover that this was something that was not admitted in the realm of University Academy. It's not. It's a fight. I was a, I was an administrator for a year for the Aboriginal Studies program in Ottawa, and I, I get to be inside the boat, seeing how how do we exclude types of scholarship and things. And I think we should include in those corpus, for instance, racist things administrators say uh, they say in office. That's part of the repeated. That should be in it. There's nothing that have to be left over. You don't have to discriminate. If you're looking for the buzz, you take everything you hear. Might not be repeated, might be an isolated incident. Bring everything in. It's important if you want to uh, sort of uh, read through different strata of discourse and, and practices uh, in a given topic. Um, and, and if you uh, go deep down and, and, and popular uh, uh, speech, you'll find different things to, uh, that's important to go there. So the things you hear on the bus can be in or, or travel into Maradero or whatever. Um, last uh, corpus finding I did was uh, expressions of shit in, in uh, French language in Quebec. And there, there are tons of them. It's amazing. Like, like that. I over two or three years, and I said, well, I'm collecting them, those expressions with the shit in it. And I had a list like that. And I started to, you know, make category and try to figure out what, what, what's going on in there. It was very interesting to see that. <clears throat> it never gets in the public realm. Never. Shit doesn't exist, really. But then, all around it, it's all surrounded by shit. <laughs> all around it. And, and a lot of those using of shit are meant to describe things that are happening in there. So it's the shadow. You, you have to look for the shadows as well. What's excluded? What's excluded is not necessarily invisible. Right? So you both, you both need the redundancy and what's left out. In order to get a sense of the realm of the repeated. But as I said, it's a patient work. And you don't have to have hypothesis when you enter a corpus. You don't have to think anything about it. It will give you the category. It will give you the theoretical framework. It's in there. It's self-organizing. You don't have to think anything about it. You don't, you don't, have, you don't need a, a theory of a nexus of a power knowledge to enter this. Just go in it. Just dive in it. You're part of it, so you can start in anywhere around you. So the wild, open, multi-sources discourse analysis, uh, big data style, is one way to do it. To, to, so the whole idea is to reconstitute uh, or uh, discover discursive uh, chains system. Um, the second strategy, 
which is dear to me, and, and this is something that I started to do more recently. Um, that I could call a tactile reception. Referring to um, it's a motion from the Walter Benjamin. It's in the piece on uh, the productivity of the work of art in the age of global. You were talking about it. Okay, it's like five So I think it's it's like made of aphorism. I think it's fifteen. It's not about that. It's not about the aura. Whatever it is, it's just a short section which is in the middle. I find it very interesting because it's saying that in our age of mechanization, of, of the technological dwelling, if you like, it's saying that to understand what's around us, a city, for, for instance, we cannot anymore uh, go by contemplation or contemplative. Later, reception. Look at it, looking at our landscapes today is not looking at that to, to a work of art. It's not. It's looking to a machine, really. So you're saying you could look at a machine as if it was a work of art. Some uh, Irish painters have trying to do this. So, so that's very unusual to have. A, a artistic representation of such a landscape, a highway. If we are to question the landscape we're in, that's what we're going to have to question. And we also have to question why is it that we don't represent this? We don't take pictures of the island when we travel. We take pictures of the monuments and gardens and, and us, mostly these stupid things. But we don't represent that. So the idea is that. Contemplative, contemplative reception is doesn't allow to get the essence of the landscape and the mechanized image. So it's the same. Instead, we have to learn tactile reception. The tactile reception is learning to receive or experiment landscapes that are landscapes of habituation. They're not spectacular. They, they don't. They don't appeal to your sense of aesthetics or anything. They're just kind of practical. They're not repeated. That's my. That's my idea. Tactile reception gives us access to the repeated in the landscape. When is it to take it to take an escalator? When is it to drive three hours on the hour? What is it to fly on the plane? Phenomenologically, what does it mean? And in terms of the dwelling we're in, so it's starting to question parking lots as the way we live. I think we have been got to this point really of questioning the parking lot as, as a place we live. I think it's way more representative than saying I live in Canada. Okay. Uh, I think you live in parking lots as a kid because they're everywhere. And there are cars at the door. And if there were to be a, you know, UFOs coming to the earth, you say, wow, they have a cult, those you know, moving things. And it's in magazines, it's, it's a large picture of them, and, you know, they identify them. But we're, we're organized by landscape of habituation. We don't see them as landscape. So tactile reception is to learn to uh, uh, experiment. Uh, those landscapes of uh, habituation. So walking in the shopping mall, sitting in front of a computer building, buildings for mass education and high teaching. They parked us in those huge tower with uh, executive rooms where we're supposed to teach. It's amazing. Why is it that I'm just going there and teaching football? Why is it that we're not talking about that? The executive building I teach critical theory in. Uh, I think it's, you know, hard stuff for critical theory. If thinking as a way of life is to is to be 
something that is active in questioning and, and being in relation with the, with the realm of the repeated, we should start to work with that as something that's around us. Tactile reception, there is also the, uh, Robert Smithson's notion of anti monument <coughs> That's so to Robert Smithson, he's a land, uh, art artist uh, who have read Heidegger very well and is proposing us to see this as a monument. It's everywhere. And it says something about the way we dwell. We don't see it, 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 but it's all over the place. We don't use it as, as, as a theoretical device. We don't interrogate it as, you know, we're still looking at, at, at Victoria in front of the parliament. What is the point of looking at that? There are many of these, you know. So if you start to look at them as monuments, you're starting to give meaning to what there is. You reconnect with uh, through aesthetics and and experiment body experimentation with, with, with the realm of the repeated. You start to do things with the thing. Um, that's a monument. That's a very important monument because this is one of the way uh, by which we accumulate money and guns. We adore them. Did you know that we adore them? We need this right now as we speak. And we need mining and we need everything. So, so these are elements of our landscapes that we have, we have a hard time to relate to. Because we don't receive them as monuments. Then you also have, um, I, I take all these as uh, experts. All, every one of these curious are, are sort of uh, ways to experiment in the landscape as an addition. Um, also think of uh, the certain braconnage. So it's idiotic expression of art we just laugh at usually that <coughs> what's that don't be drive by don't so, uh, so. what's that it's art first of all or it's religion but it's something weird it's a cyborg so why not try to use that as a monument? I think it says something about the dwelling because it says something very uh, crafty and, and, and naive about the way we eat. We need a lot of oil to eat, a lot of oil. So that makes a lot of sense. That is singular, but that is collective. That is thinking. That's just a follow up. So, driving up on the island one afternoon, we saw this sculpture. And sleeping in an altar, in an altar like that, there was a TV show about meat contamination. It says something about how we eat. It's, it's all around. We just gather pieces of scraps and, and they tell a story. That's also repetition. And that relates to the previous culture. That relates to the way we eat. All the pictures that I've shown is, is the same travel on the same highway. So if you like the, the epistemology of the highway, it's Highway 138, uh, the northern shore, uh, the St. Lawrence in Quebec. 
So you drive, you drive, you take those pictures of landscape of habitation, and then you're stuck because there's an uh, in band blocking the road for the reasons that we could talk about at the moment. And that points to, and I will uh, finish with that. I would love to continue. The idea that to explore the reality of the, the repeated, you need not only to work on this course through redundancies, not only to work on the landscape through cognitive landscape reception, but to, uh, tactile reception and time movement and real life. Uh, but you also have to have a very fine sense of what cannot be repeated. And that's very easy to find. Just go to a dinner party and say we don't live in a democracy. And then note the conjuration words you hear. Syria, Afghanistan, our ancestors. People will start to throw at you things which say this is not something we can hear. This is not something to be repeated. It's, it's very, very easy. It's, it makes me laugh when we discuss politics and, and change. And, you know, people say, and it's sort of Foucauldian uh, trope that we cannot identify the power anymore because it's all part of it. I don't believe that. Just do things that are not repeatable. You'll, you'll have to draw in the face very quick. But those guys, that's what, they, that's what they have, that's what they teach us. They say things that we cannot hear. So they have to block the road in order for us to, to hear them. So the, the last part of, of this descriptive program, we didn't get into action. Is to, very, is to be very attentive to what cannot be heard. So take an address in lost causes and what's marginal, unheard, unreadable, unusable. Listen to people blocking roads, the, the kind of words they use, the way they, ad they address themselves to the repeater. They talk to the realm of the repeater. And, and their language cannot make it to the buzz, but it's all around it. And it's starting with, with, with what can be heard, the shadow that you really start to learn about what it is in the blood. And then I'll just finish with that. And to go on a little bit saying that what cannot be repeated is very simple after all. And I've, I've been conducted many analyses. Always boil down to what doesn't enter the realm of the repeated is what question the states are. That is not possible. That is not possible. Even, even in a dinner party, it is not possible. Even with your mo most progressive friends, that is not possible to really put in, into question state sovereignty. So that's why we're doing political theory on, the, on the indigenous land and, and we'd like to do something about it. But all we can do is ask a question to why is it we'd like to do something about it, right? Because we're at the bottom of the realm of the repeated we cannot pass over state sovereignty. And what cannot be heard, what makes no sense in the buzz is that which doesn't produce capital value cannot be heard. Of course, I have many political solutions, but uh, I'll share them with you at some other time. <laughs> but I mean, we have to start to think. Repeating something else than that. 
and both of them, the way they work is that they just connect the same one and they connect to it. Because instead you have a reunification of power. It's the separation of power in society. You take, you take power outside of society and call it government. But that's a deed. If you read the Derrida's uh, Force of Love, it's basically, it's basically saying that state sovereignty is, is an iteration. It's a, it's a performance we repeat. So this very separation of uh, force and life, that is state sovereignty. That is the deed in itself. It is a performance. So how do we go about ruining that in very simple faith. In, the, in what we repeat, in what, in what we bring in, in what we connect together. Um, as for capital, it's also a separation of force and life, if you like. And because value is taken out of society and unified. So there you have a deep to. So how do we go about to really catch on that and give life? I don't think much about evolution. I rather think of um, what would be thinking as a way of life that would be this bring up this repetition. And uh, there, there's a political part and an ethical part. Gertrude Stein wrote about uh, in the making of the Americans, she said that we forget that we don't have to kill in order to live. We forget that. And that's how we can be American. So that's that's one very important uh, Ethical principle. We don't, we don't have to buy into that, that we need to kill in order to live. That's Foucault's definition of sovereignty, right? Chapter 5 of the book itself. We don't have to kill in order to live. Not buying into that when you speak, when you write, when you think, when you act as a lot. The state sovereignty is based on the fact that we have to kill in order to live. That's what it's based on. And capitalism is based on the idea that we have to pay in order to exist. So the baby being born is told that if he wants to eat, he should find a job, and in order to find a job, he has to get an education. And in order to get an education, he needs money, because you have to pay to educate yourself in order to have a job, in order to eat. It means, and we're raised in that, and I don't know why we don't say it anymore, it means in our culture that we have to pay in order to exist. Without money, we die in 10 days or so. To beg a little, do things, but basically to educate ourselves and, and, and to have a shelter and to eat, we have to pay. That's something we repeat every day. We repeat every day that we believe that we need to kill in order to live. That's why we need state sovereignty. That's what we call political freedom. That's what it is right now. And that's what we call choice. It's amazingly narrow. And it's something that we take part in every day. Why is it that we accept to pay in order to get an education? I think this is great. That's what I meant by radical. That's what I meant by post-colonial. And it's not about being heroic or anything. I pay and I live. I pay to get an education and I accept that we pay in order to live. It, it's just starting to be able to name these things and, and to create a memory of it. 
It's just about getting to know where we live. That's all I'm asking. And I think if we get to know where we live, this is revolution. We don't know where we live, but we accept this. Um, I was walking around downtown in Victoria last night. And they had the Empress Hotel, and then there's that building, the other big building with all the fancy stuff on it. And I stood up and took a picture of oh, it's a good picture of this beautiful building. And it struck me afterwards, I was looking through the photos, then I was like, oh, fuck, there's a picture, there's a power line in the way of the Empress Hotel. Like, That's not a good picture, I need to delete that. And I just like, wow, there it is, yeah, boom. Um, and yeah, I just did I thought I'd check it. <laughs> it's in the way. No, it's not in the way. This is the precise landscape we're in. Why is it that we, we don't... We don't see where we live. So just getting to that would be a revolution. That would make things very difficult for the hierarchy and you know, power of the um, I have a little list of positive events that can be straight. Um, they're just kind of slapped up together. It's, it's a project I've been on. Pursuing you know, among different theoretical measures of uh, creating a, a constitution utopic. So I was asking people, what would what would be your your political demands that are impossible, but still that we could that could happen. So I, I started to gather those demands, things we we, we could ask that we will never have, like free university but could have if we really wanted to. So one of my favorite, and this is one that I, I, I want to uh, create a committee at the UN uh, uh, gathering specialist from all, all disciplines, so, uh, psychology, economy, agronomy, etc., to provide the whole humanity a sabbatical year. And frankly, I think with the knowledge and power that's accumulated here, we could easily get that. <laughs> Give the humanity a one-year break to do whatever, you know, rest, uh, <laughs> grow tomatoes, uh, walk around the world, fight with your wife, all those things we cannot do because we're stuck in the circulation process of the ontological repetition. And, and I'm, I'm very serious about it. I, I think we have we have the capacity to do it, although we never do it. That would be revolutionary. Even just to plan it seriously. Okay, this is the knowledge, the, the general intellect we have at our disposal here, and we could do that. Of course, we won't do it, but we could. Just seeing that is revolutionary, and that's the kind of work we can do in political theory. It's precisely the kind of work we can do, building impossible political demands that, that, could, that are things we could do if we want to. So, so start this process of imagining our world. So it's, it's, it's a revolution in the imaginary, I guess. But it, it, it's a labor. So that's what I'd like you to do. It's a labor, it's hard work. So it's not dissertations on Foucault that's going to bring us there. Trust me. And I wrote stuff on Foucault, you know, taking me with it. One last short question and short answer. Okay. And after that, we'll have uh, five minute breaks so we can bring that one table and give you time to. Bathroom, do some exercise. <laughs> uh, so near the end of your talk, you, I, I thought I started to see where you could take ruins, and I was curious if I was right or if you could quickly tie in the, in the ruin in your title into the talk where you're talking about 
place in which we are right now in this kind of really unfortunate architecture in the land that we're in. Because we're, we're kind of dwelling in, in the ruins of the structure that you've nicely articulated. So I was just wondering if, if you'd agree with that and if you could take it a little farther or just quickly parse that out. Um, of course I'm just talking about us here being political theorists. So what could you do as a political theorist? Or so ruins and the practice of political theory would mean starting to use the material that surrounds you. It would be just local theorizing. That's 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 the only place where we can start to move this process. Too. So so then there is no difference between thinking and living. Living that is you know just grab what's around. Them. The trash that's around you, do something with it. it, it it's do something else with it, because because everything that's here is is ours. So what could we do with it? It's not rejecting it. it it's it's taking possession of it and doing something else. And it's, it could be a very kind process, a very beautiful process. It doesn't have to be violent. How do you differentiate that type of? Thing, that, that type of gathering of uh, and repurposing versus the braconage or, or, or legalage or other sorts, but the, 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 you know, the groups on the, on the four-wheeler that's repeating that, I mean, yeah, that's a type of recollage, you say, but it's repeating these structures that you're talking about. So how do you differentiate? Mm -hmm. Um, what, what is it repeatable in that? And I mean, mm -hmm. it requires a position to judge as what uh -huh. you, you have to be positioned. You can't be the uh -huh. to understand the position of the state and capitalists. Uh -huh. um, uh, of course, there is, um, you see the small picture down there, the yeah. very lady? It's a uh, sculpture by Dwayne Ensa. He's an American uh, uh, plastic artist. We did a series of sculpture that are just repetition of what he saw. People, American people, ordinary people. And, and of course, we could say that there's a difference between a Dwayne Hansen sculpture, which is, which, which, is, which is repetition with irony, if you like, or is showing us that this is what we repeat. It's not telling us what to think about it, but it's taking this, he objectifies the repetition and showing this. Where the, the, uh, the other sculpture, which we might presume is, is candid or unintentional, uh, well, I don't know. I don't know the man who made it. You would have to ask him what what he meant there. But he meant something because it's it's something that's superfluous. He didn't have to do that. It, so so it's, it's so it's still a braconnage. If you like, it is a black on that. And so, uh, it's no intentionality. I mean, no. I mean, is that yeah. I know. I know. So, as a political theorist, I, I can talk about intentionality. And, and what I know from, from unintentional sculpture is that it's it's at least it's it's something singular that is repeating. There's thinking in there, intentionality or not, because repeating is thinking. So it's an evanescent quality. Yeah. You sound Cody. You sound a little Cody. Why? Of course. That's why I keep uh, poking in. <laughs> This is your final word. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.